following is a video presentation of a worship service at Orville Baptist Church. you're being seated let me welcome you today to Orville Baptist Church I know that this is the summertime and during the summer we have a lot of folks out on vacation and this is the case this morning and let's pray for their safety and their soon return as we look forward to worshiping together with all God's people and those who will be joining us later online thank you for choosing Orville Baptist Church uh, for your worship experience and hopefully we have the opportunity to someday meet you in person. I enjoy seeing people face to face gathering in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. Let me uh, give a word of thanks to those of you that joined us yesterday for work day. I as pastor appreciate those that came in and got the vacation Bible school area not only cleaned up but ready to go with uh, props and posters and all the different things that are associated with this year's theme destination dig and we are looking forward to boys and girls coming tomorrow and uh, through the week and then on friday night we will have our family night commencement service i hope that you will join us if you're not a worker or a teacher involved in vbs that you will pray for us uh, for VBS week next week and then join us on Friday night. That's open to everyone uh, for our commencement time. And that way you have the opportunity to see what the boys and girls have learned all week. But again, thank each one of you who came out. We appreciate it very, very much. Let me give you a wonderful verse in Psalm 146. And verse 2, listen to what the psalmist says. I will praise the Lord, not just a few days of my life, but it says, I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And all the songs we sing, marching to Zion, and the ones we'll be singing here in just a little bit, we're singing them to the audience of God the Father 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all the angels and the saints of God in heaven are listening in on our worship. And not only does it bring encouragement to us and fellowship with us as we sing, but more importantly, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit welcome and seek that praise and worship. So after we have our prayer, just really sing with all your heart, as I know you do, and Joan will come and lead us in just a moment to these uh, hymns of, and songs of praise. And these are some of my favorites. Since I have been redeemed, send the light, and then the sanctuary choir here, I am Lord. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we join together in prayer as your people. Thank you for those that are participating in person today and those who are joining us online as they offer up prayer on behalf of this church. And Lord, the needs not only in our community and in our church, but all of our sister churches around America, around the world, as they continue to worship and navigate these difficult days, we pray that we'll be able to bring honor and glory to your name. Continue to extend the message of hope and salvation to those in our community and throughout our city and around the world. But also, Lord, to encourage and lift up one another at Orville Baptist Church. And we do so today. We know we have some folks in the hospital, others recovering from other illnesses. And we have our shut-ins and so many others that we want to bring before you. And you know the prayer list. Those names that are on the list, those that are on our hearts that are not necessarily on that prayer list, but they're on our hearts. And you know each and every one of them. And we pray, Father, that you will strengthen them today. Bring them your comfort and bring them your assurance. Strengthen us, Lord, as we prepare and engage our children in Vacation Bible School this coming week. We don't really know how many will show up, but we pray that as boys and girls come in and the workers and teachers and everyone involved that this will be a great week as we share the gospel message of Jesus Christ and encourage families and boys and girls and point them to the only hope this world really has and that's in Jesus Christ and as we lift up this theme to you, digging in, we need to find Jesus Christ as we dig into truth. And that scripture that says, which is our theme verse, uh, when you seek me with all your heart, search for me, you will find me. So you teach us that in Jeremiah, to seek you. And as we seek you, uh, you will show us the way and point us to the truth that's in Christ. So, Father, bless our worship services today as we offer up our prayer and praise to you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name and all God's people said.
that next time. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, and the Christ like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessing God's light. Let it shine for joy. may be seated.
Let's pray together. Father, I pray today as I bring the message of the hour, as we continue to offer up worship and praise to you, that you would grant to each of us your favor. And that, Father, we would see in these days moving forward the church to grow numerically, spiritually, financially, in every area to honor your name to let the world know, and particularly right here where we're located, in this area of Anderson, South Carolina, to let those folks know that you care for them and that you want to save them and want to have a relationship with them. Use our church. Use every member as we serve you and honor you and praise you and extend your message to one another and in this community. Oh God, add to the church those who would be saved. And that's our prayer in these days. We pray this in Jesus' name. As we think about that scripture before we say amen, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our thoughts and hearts would be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. In Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy, the third chapter. And we'll be looking together verses 8 through 13. We are coming at a time in the life of our church this year that we are looking at and will be selecting deacons to serve in the deacon ministry, deacon fellowship. And every year we have the opportunity, according to our bylaws and constitution, to select some men because we have a rotation system, as most Southern Baptist churches do, not all of them. But in our church, we have had the rotation uh, for some time. And so we'll be selecting some new deacons to come on board as two of our three deacons are rotating off this year. And so I wanted to spend a little time today uh, because we're having our deacon nomination next Sunday at the conclusion of the service. I wanted to share some things about deacon leadership. Now let me just give you this caveat. When we think about deacon leadership, first of all, I want you to think in terms with me before we read this passage of the word leadership. All of us as believers are called to be leaders. You are influencers. Regardless of where you serve, what you do, you influence and have leadership ability to someone in your family, at work, uh, in the church. And so when I use this word leadership, please understand there's different types of leadership. There is what we call pastoral leadership. And there are ministry teams in our church and they are guided and led by certain leaders, chair people who lead those teams. And each one have a different function. And so I want you to understand what the role and responsibility of deacon leadership is according to the New Testament. And also to talk in terms of what that means in our church called Orville Baptist Church. And in her 121 years of history, what that has looked like. As we go forward in nominating some deacons to replace those who have come off. Now, our bylaws uh, stipulate that we should have a minimum of six and we've not been able to have that in these last few years. And we're hoping as we move forward that eventually we'll be able to have a minimum of six. And then as the need arises, as we multiply, then obviously you and I would hope for more deacons. But right now we are under the current uh, leadership of three deacons. And when you next Sunday will come back to nominate deacons... We'll be asking you to nominate and list up to five. 
as we, we'd love to be able to get the full complement. I'm not saying that we're going to be able to, but at least that's our goal. Now, in thinking about the role of a deacon, please understand that various denominations and churches uh, have different interpretations as to the function and qualifications of a deacon. And I've been a Southern Baptist for most of my life, even before I became a minister. My mother, my grandparents were all part of a Southern Baptist church, so by virtue of uh, being raised in a home that had uh, affiliation with the Southern Baptist, I began to understand some things about deacons and saw deacons serve in Baptist churches, and then at the age of 18 I was converted, subsequently surrendered to the ministry, and call of God in my life at the age of 18 and through the years as a pastor I have served alongside uh, many many deacons and I can tell you honestly most of them have been such a real blessing to me personally and to the churches that I have served and I cannot do ministry without them now I will add to that there have been one or two along the way that caused me uh, a little consternation and uh, I'm not saying that every deacon function the way they should have. Please understand that a deacon in the Bible, the term is diakonos, diakonia, which means to serve or to wait on tables. Now, it doesn't mean that person is a waiter or, you know, in a restaurant, but it's the same term. And understand that when we come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications listed in Timothy... Uh, for instance, in chapters 3, verses 1 through 7, he lists the qualifications of a pastor. And incidentally, uh, verses 8 through 13 that deals with the qualifications of a deacon are very, very similar to those same qualifications that God puts on me as a pastor. And I want you to understand the most important thing about a deacon is their character who they are in the Lord. But know this, there is a difference not in spiritual qualification between a pastor and a deacon. The two offices ordained in the New Testament, and this is not my setup, the God the Father through the Holy Spirit set up the church and the New Testament church had two offices of men who served and each one of these offices pastor and it's a plurality a pastoral staff and then deacons that are ordained they have the same spiritual qualification the difference is in their function and I want us to look at that distinction because for a pastor one of my roles primary roles uh, is found in Acts chapter 6 when they were first putting together the office of the deacon and the function of the deacon office uh, was the fact that the elders and the pastors in the early church and subsequently going forward to 2021 our primary role is really twofold that is the preaching and teaching of God's word and then prayer now obviously there are many other functions a pastor does administratively caring for the flock, I'm to be responsible for the welfare, spiritual welfare of the church, and give oversight. But in order for that to happen, notice with me that in Acts chapter, we're not going to turn there, but Acts chapter 6, they had to select, the early church had to select some men to come in and do some different functions to help the church move forward because it says, as the church grew, the number of believers, and they referred to them as disciples with a little d, not the apostle, but when the scripture in the New Testament talks about disciples being added to the church, understand he is talking about believers. Because do you remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission in Matthew 28? Go you therefore and make what? Come on, this is your part. Surely we Baptists, we know that Great Commission verse. verse Go unto all the world and make what? Don't be shy. Make what? 
dis... Now you all must have had a rough weekend. <laughs> Go into all the world and make what? I can't hear you. Thank you. Don't be bashful. I mean, I'm giving you permission to interject. <laughs> Go into all the world and make disciples of all cultures, all ethnic groups, all nations. And please understand, the early church was multiplying believers, these disciples, and they said, the apostles said, we, it's really taxing us. There are so many other things going on within the church growth movement that we cannot oversee everything. We need some help. And so they selected seven men in Acts chapter 6 and... In doing so, notice how they did that. They, the church, all disciples, that was all church members during the New Testament time, they selected these men and the apostles vetted them and approved them and laid their hands on them and set them aside. That's the process. Now when we come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, we're going to look at this verse now. But again, I want to go back to that word diakonos. And I want you to think in terms of that word servant or to serve. And in the, the New Testament, you really have three levels of service in the church. Number one refers to all believers. All believers in the church are called to serve. I again refer you back to the inaugural address of John F. Kennedy when he said in his speech, Ask not what your country can do for you, rather, ask what? What can you do for your country. Now I know there are people who join the church and their mindset is, what can the church do for me? What does the church have to offer me? While the church does minister to you and has plenty to offer and has throughout her history, the mentality and motivation of every believer ought to be one of service. Ought to be one of saying, God, you've called me to this local expression called Orville Church. And not only is the church a blessing to me, but Lord, help me serve in whatever capacity that you've gifted me. I'm available for service. So level one is the level of service which is rendered by everyone. God never did call you to join a church to sit, soak, and sour. He called you to plug in and be part of that church and serving in any capacity you can. And this church has done this through the years. There's 121 years of people throughout her history who have been serving this church and serving this community and you're to be commended. But there's a second level and that uh, is rendered by those who have what is called a gift and there is this what we call the motivational gift of service. There are those people within the body of Christ that not only serve, but they have a special gift of service. And uh, that goes back to the gifts of the Spirit. And God, in His wisdom through the Holy Spirit, gives according to His desire and pleasure and will gifts to all of us. Some have more than one. No one has all the gifts. Now one of the things I commend your former pastor Trey in doing is developing these ministry teams and asking you to plug in to a ministry team that you have been gifted and you have passion and God obviously has qualified you with that gift to serve in that particular or on that particular team. So that's the second level of service. And then we come to this third level of service rendered by those uniquely gifted by the Spirit for the office of the deacon and we put that as a capital S. 
Now, it doesn't mean that a deacon is better or uh, in a higher priority than you are, but I'm just trying to distinguish the difference between those three levels. And thank God for deacons that have served at Orville Baptist Church through her history. I'm grateful for the men that I've served alongside here. And thank God for the meetings thus far that we have had. It's been a joy and a blessing. And I could tell you honestly that these three men that I've been working alongside since I became your pastor, uh, they deep in their heart want to do what is right for their Lord and for the church. And I appreciate working with them. That doesn't mean we always agree eye to eye on everything. I don't know any two Baptists that ever agree eye to eye on everything. Do you? <laughs> but when we might see something a little different, we walk away with being in unity and being agreeable and having the right spirit. And that's important. Uh, that's okay to have different uh, insights. And I appreciate throughout my ministry serving with deacons and I tell them, I, I don't come and serve as a pastor with an autocratic style or a dictatorship style. I, came, I come to serve and build consensus. And I say, I told the deacons of this church, if I'm selected as your pastor and I'm brought in, I will do my best to share with you what God puts on my heart and bounce it off of you. Now, I'm not coming in to ask your permission, but I need your input. And God has called me to lead, but as deacons, I want you to have the opportunity as you come alongside me to give input as I share with you concerns and issues that God's put on my heart. I'll bounce this off of you and get your feelings on it and your insight, and we'll pray together, and hopefully we can come back, and when we have to make decisions, we'll be on the same page. That's important to develop that time of camaraderie and that kind of consensus building within deacon leadership. Now, I have met those deacons that I've known through the years that try to run the church. Uh, most Southern Baptist churches that I've worked with, I've, like I said, most of the deacons that I've served, that wasn't their attitude. They knew they were there to serve, not to run the show. Again, I've had a few that they felt like God called them to run the church. I remember one particular deacon in one church that I pastored. Oh my goodness, did he really cause me all kinds of problems. I did my best to be gracious with him and to work with him, but he had nothing to do with that. He simply would say from time to time, well, this is my grandpa's church. And he's been here all these years, and I'm, he's been a charter member and I remember in some of the meetings he would say, and God has called me to be the chairman of the deacons so I can watch this church and make sure nothing is done that would offend my grandpa. And I said, well, uh, Ronnie, I, as far as I know, this is not your grandpa's church. It's not your church. And, you know, you don't need to protect the church. This belongs to the Lord. He's the head of the church. And I cannot tell you how many times that issue came up. And eventually he decided, I'm going to part ways with this church. If I can't run it and protect it, I'm out of here. And it was really a blessing that he stepped down. Folks, listen, a deacon is not called to be the deacon board to govern and run the church. They're servants of the church. And I want to show you in the Bible what the Bible says are qualifications for deacon ministry. So let's look at it together quickly, and let's outline it here in the message today. Verse 8 and following, deacons, diakonos, likewise, just like a pastor, same qualifications, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested. And then, if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, he speaks to the wives, and they come alongside to help that deacon and pray for that husband as they do their ministry in the church. Are be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. And a deacon must 
be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. The deacon ministry of leadership is a very humble one and a very honored one. And as we move forward next Sunday for deacon selection, you obviously through the years listing and nominating deacons understand the role and requirements and qualifications of the deacons. So again, some of this is review, maybe some of this is new for some of you, but let me just quickly run through these and uh, ask you to be in prayer, as I know you are, for men that will step up and serve in this ministry. First of all, the deacon is to be worthy of respect, of good reputation. The word in the Greek is the word for grave or to be, it's called, it's simonos, which means serious. Uh, when you and I select deacons, we don't just need to select somebody who's frivolous, who is just casual in the way they serve and just really don't take the office seriously. Somebody that in the community and in the church that you have observed by their lifestyle, that they have gained respect, that they are, and a word you might want to use here, in their conduct or stately or dignified. Not that they are holier than you, but they carry themselves in such a manner through their conversation and their conduct that you would say that is someone of great reputation and has proved themselves in the community and in our church as someone worthy of respect. And there's a second one, uh, these personal character qualifications. He says to be sincere, that word in the Greek means do not be a deacon with a double tongue. Now what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that you and I have deacons that come on board that don't say one thing to one person and then turn around and say something altogether different to another person. What they say to you, they can say to anyone else, there is not a double standard or a forked tongue. And so he said, make sure when you have a deacon who serves in that capacity that they're sincere and genuine in their speech. They're consistent in their speech. And they are not guilty of being a two-tongued person. To speak consistently, righteously, honestly, and uprightly. Here's the third qualification. And we're not going to spend time to go into this in detail because I will tell you that various uh, denominations and even in our own Southern Baptist Convention, there are different interpretations to this particular verse. Not given to too much wine. Not indulging in much wine. So you would say, well, does that mean a deacon ought to drink and can drink as long as he doesn't indulge? The issue here... Please understand in the New Testament, and one of these days I, I'll share with you both from Old and New Testament what the Bible says about alcoholic beverages. Do you not know and understand that in the New Testament days, the wine that they drank is not the same alcoholic content of the wine today? It's different. So when you think about the word wine in the New Testament, people... Don't compare apples to apples. They think that any alcohol, it's okay if you don't drink very much at all, but most of the wine they drank in the New Testament was wine that was added to water because the water was uh, so poor they would put a little bit of grape juice or grape uh, fruit of the vine and they would mix it and it was like 10 to 1. The issue is that a gentleman who serves in the office capacity of a deacon should not be a wine member, should not be given to alcohol. And I know that in the Southern Baptist churches that I've been part of, I've never served with uh, any deacon that even drank at all. And you say, well, what's your stance? I'd rather just everyone to abstain, to be honest with you. You know why? Because alcohol is such a problem in America. And... The issue is not taking a little wine for the stomach's sake or drinking a little wine. The issue is it damages 
your testimony. Because when people see you purchasing or drinking wine, it automatically puts a red flag up to a non-believer, and you know this to be well, they're looking for any excuse to point a finger for not coming to Christ. And I don't want to be guilty of being a stumbling block in that area. So my stance has been through the years, God help me and help me to serve with men who just abstain from it altogether so it won't damage our reputation or our testimony. And you don't need to drink alcohol anyway. My goodness, there's so many other wonderful drinks out there. Of course, you can abuse any drink. Uh, and so here he says, don't indulge. Don't let that wine control you. Don't have a deacon who is given over to alcohol. I had a fellow who uh, in my one church talked with me as he was being considered as a deacon. He said, you know, I'm struggling with this. I, they selected me as a deacon, but my wife and I have friends over from time to time and we keep wine in the refrigerator and, and people come in and drink. And he said, but I'm uncomfortable serving as a deacon having wine and going to the store and purchasing wine. I said, well, Joe, what do you think you ought to do? He said, my wife and I have discussed this and we decided we're not going to do it any longer. I don't want to serve as a deacon or, uh, and have that as a bad testimony. And so from that day forward, he never, he said, they're going to have to drink whatever we have in there and it won't be wine. They still be our guests, but it won't be that. And then the fourth, he said, do not be greedy of filthy lucre's sake. In other words, don't be in it for uh, money. Uh, don't use it to, don't manipulate your office to, for financial gain. I don't know that I've ever served with a deacon that that was their motivation. So you see, this has to do with their character. And then I want you to look lastly at the second category. And we kind of drill down a little bit further. And we see the spiritual life. He says, these men that you select should hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, with a pur pure conscience. What is he saying? He says, don't select a man to serve that doesn't know his Bible, doesn't know what he believes. And men that serve in that capacity alongside with the pastor need to have, watch this, not only a good working knowledge of theology, doctrine, belief, they need to be able, when asked, to give a reason for the hope that lies in them, and they should know their Bible. Now, it doesn't mean they've got to be a Bible scholar, but it means they need to understand the theme of the Bible, how to present the gospel, what the, the story of redemption is all about from Old Testament to New Testament. They need to have a good understanding of theology. And every deacon should be able to have that knowledge. And also it says not only hold the mystery of the faith, but do so with a pure conscience. Now watch this. You, I know, would want a pastor who knew his Bible well, but he also did everything within his ability to practice and live out what he preached. Do, did you want a pastor like that? Or would you rather have a pastor get up and just give you all the knowledge that he knows of the Bible, but he doesn't put it into practice himself? What kind of pastor would that be? If I got up here and said, let me tell you what the Bible teaches about prayer, but I neglect prayer. What if I got up here and talked to you about how important it was to come to church, but I would just come whenever I wanted? I mean, you would want a pastor that lived out, at least he's not a perfect pastor. There's no perfect pastors or perfect deacons. And by the way, you're not perfect either. We're all on a journey. But you want to have your pastor and your deacons, and you as well, by the way, to practice what you believe. I remember somebody had said well to me years ago, you really only believe what you practice. Everything else is just talk. So a deacon, just like the pastor, needs to have a pure conscience. That means he is not only understanding of the Scripture and what the Bible says, but he's doing his best 
to live out and practice what he believes. And that's what uh, Paul is saying here, writing to Timothy. Then he says he needs to be tested. Now that doesn't necessarily mean age, but it means maturity. It is someone here in the New Testament that isn't just having a one-time written test or is put on a a probationary period. It is someone that constantly in their life is maturing. They're consistent. And you have and I have been able to observe them through the years on their conduct and their conversation and their attitude. And you want a man serving that their attitude is right and they've demonstrated that throughout their life and that it's consistent and ongoing evaluation as they walk with the Lord. And then, blameless. It says here, uh, they need to be blameless. And the scripture, by, by saying that, it says that there's nothing against them. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean, again, that that deacon is going to be perfect and is not going to mess up from time to time? No. That means in their heart, their heart is purely motivated to do as best that they can. It doesn't mean that they'll make mistakes along the way. I don't know any pastor or any deacon serving in this office capacity throughout their years, regardless of how many years they've served, that they get to a place where they've got it all down and they're perfect. He doesn't say, let the deacon be sinless. Do you know of any person on planet earth that has achieved sinlessness in their life? How many of you think that you in your life have reached the point that you've never sinned again. Raise your hand. No. We are all having struggles as long as we remain in this body on this earth. We'll trip up and make mistakes along the way. So Paul is saying not sinless but blameless. Don't let anybody accuse you that your heart's not pure and purely motivated. And then Here's one that's a big debate, and I'm not going to have time, maybe at a later date, address this. But down in verse 11, uh, he'll talk about, uh, or verse 12, a deacon must be the husband of but one wife. And in Southern Baptist, uh, the convention, there are varying opinions on that. Can a deacon who's divorced serve? In some Baptist churches, they, they allow it. And the churches that I have served alongside and with, and the churches uh, that I've known of colleagues and pastors, most of them that I've been aware of, they've never had a deacon that would serve on that, in that capacity that's been divorced. And what I look at, and it's, it's really based upon the, that particular church's interpretation of that verse. And like I said, I would not have time today to cover all the ins and outs of the various interpretations of that. But suffice it to say that the best thing a person could do when looking at this, this particular part, is to say, okay, what has been the, the history and the precedence of the church, in this case Orville Baptist Church, in her history, has there ever been a deacon that has served that has been divorced and remarried? And you look back on her history and try to make that decision. And you say, well, what if after a while the church decides they want to change that and they would allow somebody that maybe scripturally uh, was allowed to serve even though they divorced and maybe something happened and there's an issue where you think that they still qualify. Well, that would have to be something the church as a whole would have to consider. And if ever that came to that point, you would do that in consideration of number one, the scripture. Number two, the precedent and history of this church and how deacons have served in the past. So when you come to this nomination uh, list, you need to think about all these qualifications and to say, Lord, let me prayerfully consider 
putting on this list this man whose name I list here and pray about meets these qualifications. And so that will be the process in which we will go forward next Sunday. We'll come back and take the names that you've put on a piece of paper up to five names. And the process is, just like the New Testament and in the bylaws, we collect those names. And we will look at the number of names of men who are highest, get the highest amount of uh, votes, uh, if you want to say vote. But then, you know, whoever gets the highest will go down the list that way. And what happens is the pastor will then begin to look at each one of these men and what we call vet them or qualify them and make sure that they line up with this scriptural qualifications. And once we determine that, we, I, will call each one of these men. And the other part of the process is we will ask them, your name has been selected. And according to the New Testament, we know that you qualify. And we need to ask you, will you consider prayerfully coming on board to serve as a deacon during this next rotation period? Now what we're hoping to do is to have up to five names. I don't know that we're going to be able to get them. But we'd like to see five names. And uh, when we see those names, what our goal is, is to say, okay, we need one of you men to serve one year alongside Jimmy Brown. Because Jimmy Brown uh, has one year left on the rotation. It'd be nice to have another man join him in that one-year rotation. Two, if we get them, would be a two-year rotation. And the other two, if we get them, uh, would go on a three-year rotation. Does that make sense? So that way you have everything in the rotation system according to the bylaws. Your part is to go to the Lord in prayer and come back next Sunday... And write down those names that you believe are qualified. And some you know have served already. So it's not a matter of uh, pre-qualifying them. They've already served in the past. And according to our bylaws, a man is eligible to serve again after they have served once they come off one year. And after one year, they're eligible to come back on if they're selected. So we've got some men like that in this church. Please note as we get ready to close today that these deacons currently serving have had to take on more responsibilities than what is usually required and expected of a deacon. My prayer and hope is going forward that we can, again, have enough folks in this church where we can remove some of those responsibilities that these men have had to shoulder because we don't have enough people serving in various areas. So they've taken on more than what a deacon ought to take on. And I commend them for it. As I had these meetings with these three guys, and I told them my desire as a pastor is to be able to have some other ministry teams come on board that will help alleviate some of those responsibilities that you have. You don't need to be the guys worrying about the budget, giving the, the financial stuff. That's not your role. You're not to really be administrators. But you are functioning as custodian. You're functioning as finance people. You're functioning and way more than what you ought to function in. And it's because they don't have a choice. We don't have, for instance, one area that I as your pastor would want to see occur in the future is putting together a finance team who would be responsible to look at every year the budget, and the finances that these deacons are having to do. That should not be on their table. They should not be the ones who are always responsible to have to cut the grass. And do all the custodial work. Although we do have people in the church that are stepping up and helping. And God bless you for helping. But perhaps why some deacons uh, who have been selected 
And uh, when we call them, they might refuse to serve is because they say, man, I, I can't do all that. <laughs> That's just a lot that you're putting on my table to function as a deacon to do all those things. Perhaps there's some men that would serve in the capacity of a deacon if they didn't have to do all those other responsibilities. Now we're not there yet. But that's hopefully in the future where we can get, where we can again be able to come up with some kind of team that would oversight, give oversight to how we do cleaning and all that kind of stuff. But for right now, it's been these three men who have been taking on and shouldering a lot more responsibility. And I hope that can change in the future. I know we're an older congregation. And some of us are not able to do what we've done in the past. Uh, I know that your body, your brain says you can do it, but your body says what? <laughs> no, nope, ain't going to happen. So, coming to our next Sunday service, let's pray and ask God to help us get those men that will step up into that deacon position uh, going forward. And again, thank God for John and for Tommy and for Jimmy. And for those who will come on and serve alongside me. I can't do it myself. I need those deacons. I need those, that type of leadership where I can bounce off as your pastor. Because again, I need to have men that can work alongside me. So I can continue to give spiritual leadership for this church and to this church and in the community. Alright? So we're not going to do an invitation song today. We're just going to bow together in prayer. And then I have some announcements. Father, as we bow together in prayer today, we know what the New Testament teaches. We know, Lord, what the practice has been through the years of this church in selecting deacons in this nomination process. And we are praying together as a congregation going forward next Sunday to pray as we list names up to five men. Oh God, my prayer is that someday, some way, we'll be able to have that minimum of six and perhaps beyond. We pray, God, that you will put your hand on this church and help us to grow. That we would see members added to the church, people coming to Christ. Because the most important thing about in any area we serve as we grow is to give you glory and point boys and girls, young people, families to Christ. And we pray that as we move into this next week, we'll see uh, some of that fruition, even as we talk with boys and girls about coming to Christ. And so we make this our prayer today, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.